Welcome to today's webinar, 10 Things You Need to Know About Implementing ISO 9001-2015 Compliant Risk-Based Thinking, sponsored by HARPCO. I'm Dirk Ducharme, Editor-in-Chief for Quality Digest, and I will be your host for today's webinar. The concept of risk-based thinking has been implicit, really, in previous editions of ISO 9001 through uh, requirements planning, review, and improvement. However, uh, the new ISO 9001-2015 standard requires companies to use risk-based thinking to manage their business. So there's been a shift there. And if you want to implement an ISO 9001-2015 compliant quality management system that uses risk-based thinking, to optimize your QMS processes and then select opportunities, there are a few things you need to know. So in this webinar, our presenter is going to explain key ISO 9001 2015 risk-based thinking requirements, as well as provide examples of what ISO 9001 2015 compliant risk-based thinking implementation looks like throughout the product development process. Uh, but before I introduce uh, today's speaker, just a reminder, Anytime, you can send questions to us using the Q&A box. You can find the Q&A box in the lower right corner of your screen. Or if you see a green pull-down menu at the top of the screen, click that, and you will see a Q&A button that you can click to open the Q&A box. Okay, our presenter today is Richard Harpster of Harpco Systems. Richard has more than 30 years of experience in implementing risk-based quality management systems. He is a recognized expert in the application of FMEAs and has invented several new concepts, including the linking of design FMEAs to process FMEAs in 1990, which then became an automotive industry standard 18 years later. His latest inventions in the field of risk-based project lifecycle management include requirements risk assessment, usage risk assessment, multiplated multiple integrated cause analysis, and rapid integrated problem solving. He has also published several papers on the topic of risk-based project lifecycle management. Okay, Rich, it is all yours. All right, thank you. I'd like to welcome everybody. Uh, just to begin, I'd like to just talk about what we're going to try to accomplish. Uh, one of the things is a few, if you want to successfully implement risk-based thinking, there's a few fundamentals you have to understand both in terms, of, in terms of risk management itself and what the standard requires. And then after we understand what the standard requires, I'm going to provide you an example of a basically ISO 9001-2015 compliant system. Now, you need to understand that there, the standard itself is non-prescriptive. So if anybody comes to you and says, this is what you must look like in order to be compliant. It's simply not true because the standard doesn't define what you have to look like. But what I'm going to show you, I feel quite confident that if you had a system that looked like something like this and had these particular elements, uh, I'm pretty sure you'd pass any audit. And then finally, we're going to talk about, you know, what I believe is the number one reason for implementing risk-based thinking. The examples that I show you, they're not just going to be storybook. These are, these are uh, I should say, the techniques I'm going to show you. These are techniques that I've uh, used over the past 30 years. On this screen, you can see some of the things, uh, obviously being from the automotive, worked on several transportation-type products. Some of the most interesting products I did was working with Abbott Laboratories. We basically develop molecular assays to, which use DNA to detect things like HIV. Uh, as you can see, I worked on spinal implants, Parkinson's treatment, and in general industry, steel, aluminum injection molding. I've probably done this, so probably to well over 200 different types of products. So I feel quite confident that what I'm going to show you is probably applicable to the businesses that you're in. Uh, as far as risk goes, there's two components of risk. One is the probability of an objectionable incident, and the other is the severity of harm when it occurs. So the important thing with risk is, is, is to understand the source of that risk, which is what actually causes that objectionable incident. When you go to reduce risk, there's two ways of doing it. One is reducing the probability of the incident, the other is reducing the severity of harm. Now, you're going to find that when you go to try to reduce risk, 
it's much easier to stop the incident than to try to contain the effects. You're also going to find as we go through this talk that when you go to reduce risk, it's critical that you get to the root cause. If somebody were to ask me what's the number one reason people are unsuccessful at reducing risk, I would say they don't get to the root cause. They deal with the symptoms. <clears throat> Next question I get asked is, well, what sources of risk do I have to work on? You know, what are the sources of risk in the company? Well, interestingly, your opportunities are a source of risk. Say you have someone that comes to you with new business. Well, an objectionable incident would be you take that new business and you end up delivering that product late or you end up delivering it at a higher cost. Now, the harm that you're going to experience, obviously, could be damage to your company's reputation or financial loss. I mean, I see quite a bit, quite a few companies who, in their attempt to grow, take on business that they really shouldn't take on. They're not ready yet. Maybe they'll be ready in three, five years, but at that point in time. And in this particular case, if you didn't have the in-house expertise to handle this new product type, uh, you could find yourself in a, a very bad situation. The other area that the standard says that you absolutely have to use risk on is processes. And if we take the risk definitions that I gave you and we translate those to process language, Basically, any time one of your processes fail, that's what we call an objectionable incident. And then any time, and so when those processes fail, the effects of that failure, both on you and your customer or anybody whose life is impacted, that's what we call the harm. And then when we examine, you know, why did the process fail, you know, whether, and we're going to talk about different types of processes, that root cause of the failure is what we call the risk source. Now, when you look at the standard, and the, in, the standard is non-prescriptive in terms of saying you have to manage risk here, but what the standard does say is whatever processes you have in your quality management system, you must manage risk. So you get to define what processes make up your QMS, okay? Now, what we're going to go through, and when I show you what risk management looks like or what risk-based thinking looks like, we're going to look at a typical design and manufacturing company, and those typical company, those types of companies typically have five, these five what I call core processes. The first thing is you have customers. So one of the things you have to do is define what the customer wants. The second thing is, is when that customer talks to you, they do not talk to you in a language you can design to. They will say things to you like, I want it to look good, or I want it to last long, or I want it to be quiet. Well, what does looking good, what does lasting long, what does being quiet mean? If you gave that to a design engineer, they wouldn't know. So you have to go to a design engineer and say, hey, uh, it's got to be resistant to X number of cycles under these environmental conditions. A designer can design to that. So the second process that every company has to have if you design product is the ability to translate the customer's requirements to a language that your designers can design to. Now, once you have the design requirements, you obviously have to design a product. So your next process is going to be the design process. Then the next process, which many people uh, uh, sometimes ignore or don't think about, is I can have a, I can get the customer requirements right. I can get the design requirements right. I can design the product right. But if the product is not used the way I think it's going to be used, that product can end up failing. So one of the things that people who design and manufacture products should consider or think of when they're designing products is, what failures could we have just because we don't quite understand or we miss the way one of our customers is going to use this product? And then the final thing is, when we have these design specs and we make sure we have a user-friendly product, we got to build the thing to spec. So what we're going to do for the rest of the presentation is we're going to take these five steps and I'm going to kind of I'm going to show you what risk-based thinking looks like when you address these particular steps. <clears throat> so if you go into standard and, you see, and there's, there's there are basically four key steps that you are required to do and actually you should do in order to manage process risk. The number one thing is, is whatever process you're working on, you have to define its inputs and its outputs. 
if you have multiple processes, you have to define, in your QMS, you have to define the sequence of those processes and how they interact with each other, because that, that can impact risk. Finally, you have to take each of the processes, you have to define the risk, and then once you identify all the risk, you have to have a plan to address them. Now, what's going to happen is, is you're going to find out, excuse me, that when you do a risk assessment of your processes, you're going to have more risk than you have time, money, and people to deal with. So you're going to have to prioritize what it is you're going to go after, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. So we took it, if we look at our first process, which is defining customer requirements, we can see that we have a voice of a customer that we're going to have to capture. And we're going to capture those requirements, but again, the question is, did we capture them correctly? If you think of your particular businesses and ask yourself, have there any, ever been a case where either customer requirements were incomplete or improperly defined, and you ask yourself what the impact of that was, I'm sure you'll say that it's quite severe. In fact, what I, in 30 years, I think one of the things companies do least well is getting the customer requirements right and transferring those to design requirements. So to teach you what that risk looks like, we're going we're gonna to basically take the point of view that we're a, we're a new lawnmower company, and we want to come up with this ABC mower. And we went and we looked at the industry. We looked at the three main competitors. We have a competitor, A. He, they sell this high-end machine. They got 20% of the market share. You can see their current performance. They're the heaviest, but they have the highest horsepower. They have the best blade wear, and, but you pay for it, 595 bucks. Competitor B, they're lower weight, lower horsepower, not as good as sharpening performance, and they're the cheapest on the market. And then we have this middle range competitor C, who had, he weighs 50 pounds, horsepower is four, so between the three and the five, 20 hours before sharpening, so the blades don't quite last as well, and definitely much cheaper than the more expensive, but not quite as cheap as the least expensive. Well, we're gonna have to sit down and we're gonna have to decide if we want 30% market share, where do we think we should put those requirements? Well, you can see that where we decide where I put these particular requirements, every one of these represents risk if we guess wrong in terms of which of these is most important to our customers. So in the case of the 50, obviously we're not as light as the 40. In the case of the horsepower, we're not as high as the 5. In the case of the blade where we don't meet the 35 and the 310, we're not the cheapest. So, so the bottom line is, is when we set these requirements, we're going to A, one thing we're going to have to try to decide is which of these are most important to the customer. And the bad news is if we get this wrong, we're not going to achieve our 30%. So let's assume this is what we decide to go with. Well, now we move to the next thing, and that is, we have to translate those design requirements to a level of detail that our designers can design to. And so, so our, we release our design requirements to the design group. Uh, I'm sorry, the design requirements group, and our designers will be part of that, where we're going to set up a set of design requirements, and we're going to go through this process. I should have called, told you this process is what we call requirement risk assessment. And after going through that process, if we deem that the risk is okay, we're going to release those design requirements and start the design process. If, however, we decide that the risk is not okay, we'll stay in this loop. Now, people say to me, they go, well, why would I ever set, uh, you know, design, you know, I should be, this should be an easy thing to do. Well, it's really not. And, that, and the reason is, is sometimes you can have what we call competing requirements. If you think of an automobile, you know, people would like 100 miles per gallon in all cars, but they also want that vehicle to be safe. So what typically happens is the way I get better fuel performance out of an automobile is I take weight out of it. But then when I take weight out of it, what happens is that vehicle can become less, less safe. So what happens is, that design engineer, when you're trying to set those design requirements, you've got all these competing requirements. And so what typically happens when you release these requirements, you're actually going to release a set of requirements that's not, you know, up front, 
It's not going to meet all the customer requirements, but you think is good enough that the customer will purchase it. So let's look and see what that risk looks like using our example. If you go to the bladeware section, you'll notice that when I talk about hours of sharpening, hours before sharpening required, we don't have any conditions of performance. I mean, if I had, you know, if you, if you don't uh, if you don't water your lawn and the lawn's real sparse, obviously it'd be easy to run for 25 hours. If, however, if you have really healthy grass and it's very dense, mowing 25 hours could be pretty hard without the blades going dull on you. So it's very important that when we go to our design engineers that we don't just tell them I should say, we don't just tell them 25 hours of sharpening, but we have to tell them the conditions under what it's got to be delivered. And you're going to see later on uh, when we start talking about design how important it is to have design requirements that you can verify. The bottom line is, is if you don't have design requirements that you can verify, uh, you can't manage risk. Okay. So coming out of here, we have, a, we have an understanding of what our mower has to do, and so now what we're going to do is we're going to move into the design process. So, so we're going to release the design requirements to the design group. They're going to do a design, and then we're going to perform a design schema. Now, one of the common misconceptions of a design schema is that you use a design schema to come up with a design. No, the design schema is really an audit, an audit of the product design specifications. We want to make sure, which, and that's basically the instructions on how to make the product. We want to make sure that before we release them, that they give us what we call an acceptable level of risk. And again, we're going to have the same problem. If we have competing performance requirements, and it can be difficult to come up with product specs that can meet all the requirements as well. So what happens is we stay in this loop until we get adequate risk. So let's look and see what that looks like. Well, here is a design schema for the ABC mower. And this is the condition that we have to meet where we have to provide 24 hours of sharpening under these conditions, fescue, here's the density of the grass. And one of the failures would be is that we wear prematurely. And so what happens is instead of the cutting the grass, we're literally carrying the grass and we're damaging the grass. Now in this cost column, it's the job of the design engineer to look at their design specifications that they set and ask themselves the question, what did I specify? That if I incorrectly specify it, it could lead to these mower blades wearing prematurely. And in this particular case, these blades are going to be heat treated, and there's obviously going to be this probably, there'll probably be a minimum heat treat hardness. It actually, maybe even a maximum because if you hit stones, you don't want the blade to break, and you wouldn't want the blade to be brittle. But in this case, we're concerned about it being too low. So now we come over here to the detection controls. Well, the job of these controls, whether you call it prevention or detection. Their job is to catch bad specs. So it's the job of these controls to assess the adequacy of this, to make, assess whether this condition exists with respect to this failure we're trying to prevent. And it's out of the design verification, and these two columns is what forms the content of your DV plan that we get this occurrence rating. And if you go way back, you know, to the beginning of the presentation, I told you that risk was based on severity of harm and probability of occurrence of the objectionable incident. So we basically call these blue components here, these are the one that determine the probability of exposure to the incident. I'm sorry, these here determine the severity of harm, and it's these two together that are going to help us determine risk. But one other comment, a common mistake found in basically all the standards I know in publication is they define occurrence as the probability of the cause. It is not that. It is, remember, it's the probability of the incident due to the cause. So basically, this is a definition here. So it's not just the cause, it's this cause's relationship to this mode, because this one cause here could cause other problems as well. So now, now we've designed it right, okay, we feel quite confident in our design, 
and we're ready to release our design not to manufacturing, but we want our use, and the activities are going to be done in parallel to the people who are responsible to assessing the risk due to usage. Because bottom line is we're going to put this lawnmower in the hands of people who have to use it, and there's things we don't want them to do, and there's things that we want them to do, okay? And we have to try to anticipate what we don't want them to do, and if they do those things, how we can prevent it. And then the things we do want them to do, we kind of try to figure out how we're going to get them to do it. So what we have is what we call a usage risk assessment. And this is very common in the medical industry. If you go to your uh, go to the pharmacy today and you get a prescription from your doctor, they're going to hand you a piece of paper that describes a lot of, you know, things to look out for, things to watch for. That's the package insert. And the medical industry spends a lot of time on thinking about the mistakes people can make when using the drug, and it's their job to try to prevent them. Well, in our particular case, we have this requirement that we want to last 25 hours. Now, it's interesting to note, we know the mowers are going to last more than 25 hours. So this is going to require input from the user if we're going to consistently hit this performance requirement. So in this particular case, we get this premature blade failure, we damage the grass, but we come over here and we go, what could the user do or not do? What could the user do that we don't want them to do? Or what didn't the user do that we need them to do? Well, one of the things they didn't do is they didn't sharpen the blade per the instructions that we gave them. And as a result, when they put that blade back in, it was not in the condition that we expected it, and consequently, we don't get the wear. Well, we then ask ourselves, what did we do? What did we do when we designed it, or what did we do in the instruction? Now, what you'd like to do in a design is anticipate all these failures and make your design so it doesn't matter what they do. But there's kind of no way that we can create a design that's going to guarantee, or at least I don't know, one, the proper blade sharpening. So what we do is we create a set of instructions. And our hope is that these instructions will be clear enough such that people do it correctly. And just like we have a design verification plan to make sure that the design pro or the product design specs are correct before we release them, we're going to have a usage instruction adequacy in this, you know, some type of verification. In this case, we're going to do some type of study. So again, occurrence has the same definition, probability of the failure mode due to the cause. And again, we see that these, these blue are the ones that determine the probability of the objectionable incident, and the yellow determines the severity of the harm. So now, we basically, we got the right customer requirements, we got the right design requirements, we released it to design, design came up with a design that's adequate, we released the design to the usage people, they came up with the usage controls, we're good to go, and now we're ready to make it. So we release the design to manufacturing. Now we take that process through a process FEMA, which is a risk assessment of the adequacy of the process in producing a product that'll meet these design specs. If that risk is not okay, we stay in this loop until it's okay, and then we release the process for use. So let's see what that looks like. Well, if we were to go and look at the motor, I mean the mower uh, assembly line, we're going to see that there's a, there's a place either in a feeding uh, process or in the main process where we heat treat the mower blade. And the failure of this process is when we miss a specification. So the bottom line is from design, they gave us this heat treat hardness spec for the mower blade. And when we heat treated it, and it came out of the heat treat oven, that blade was too low. If that blade gets shipped, what's going to happen is we're going to have premature mower blade wear and we're going to have damage to the grass. There's a severity of harm. Now, what we do is we have to look at the process and we have to ask ourselves, what are the sources of variation? And when you do a process FEMA, you assume that every step prior to use has been done correctly, except for receiving. So in this case here, we would assume that all the materials came in in spec, and we'd be asking ourselves the question, what is the source of the objectionable incident of the heat treat hardest being too low at the motor where we're heat treating the mower blade? Well, one of them is the temperature controller of the oven. If that temperature controller would go out of calibration, 
the temperature of that oven could go low, we wouldn't get the heat treat hardness that we need, and consequently, we'd have the excessive wear. So now we ask ourselves, what do we have to control? So is there, what is, what can we take in our process and control it so that this cause doesn't happen and if we can prevent this cause, then we don't have to worry about this objectionable incident. In this case, we're gonna do calibration of the controller on a regular basis. Now we also have this detection control. It's very important to understand this detection control isn't necessarily gonna prevent the harm because this isn't a safety issue. If I, if I find this out of spec, more than likely I'm gonna to have to scrap it. So detection controls are designed to catch failure modes. They're de designed to contain defects. And so the only time that they ever impact your risk is if perhaps this condition led to safety and you were able to capture it internally. And we're gonna talk later on some of the mistakes people make when they use FEMAs to try to assess risk. So, so real quickly in this one here, um, so this prevention control is gonna control whether or not this cause happens to prevent this mode. And the same thing goes, this occurrence is the probability of this particular product condition due to this particular cause. It is not the probability of the cause. You know, I'd, I'd have you all, when you go home tonight or at your office, open up your FEMA books and see how many of them incorrectly tell you that this occurrence is the probability of the cause. It has been a mistake that I've seen for 30 years and it just continues to hang on. So, so what we've created is We've now, if we, if we go back to what we had to do, we had to list our processes, we had to list our inputs and our outputs, we had to list our sequence, we had to define our risk. Well, the next step is we have to have a risk plan. So as I told you before, when you get done with your FEMA, you're gonna have more risk than you have time on your people to deal with. And so the question becomes, what is it that you work on? And the, one of the best ways to do this is so what we call a risk matrix. Now this, you know, this is uh, when I'm, I'm 63 now, and this was the original class column. And when it first came out, the class symbol, it was used to identify, I mean, you'd look up the severity. And in the case of our first example, if you remember, it was a seven. And the occurrence, it was a four. So because there's a symbol there, wherever there's a symbol, that's what we call an objectionable level of risk. And so we would work on it. All these other places, all these combinations where you see no symbol, these are considered acceptable areas of risk. Now people say to me, well, well, don't we have to work on all of them? Well, trust me, if you do a design FEMA, process FEMA, use of risk assessment right, you'll have enough items in this area that you won't have to worry about the ones down here. I mean, there'll be, if you get rid of these, you will make more money than you ever hoped to make. So now the next question is, you told me what to work on. Oh, so let's look at what this looks like. So if we, if we take our first FEMA, this was our design FEMA. This is electrical motor, sorry, that should say mower. I apologize for that. Um, so the bottom line is, is that we have a four and a seven, and then our K that gives us an RNB, so we definitely would work on this row. In this particular one, our seven and our two, if I quickly come back to our grid and I pick up our seven and our two, you see what, there's nothing here. So we would not work on that one. And then we have a seven and three. So if we go back to our grid, uh, seven and three, it looks like I, and we wouldn't work on that one either. Okay, so of our, of our three risk issues, sorry, of our three risk issues that we found, we'd only work on one of them. The other two would be considered acceptable risk. As I told you before, you're not gonna be able to make them all go away. So the next question, because, oh, before I do that, one other thing. There's ways, there's proper ways to determine what you should work on and there's improper ways. As I said before, I believe using the risk table is the proper way. Some improper ways are these three here. One is risk priority number. And, and that, the reason that's improper is it involves the multiplication of severity times occurrence times a detection. And what happens there is I can have, 
I can have something that causes a lot, like on a design FEMA, I could have something that causes someone to be killed. I can have like a two or a three where I'm killing one out of every 100,000 of my customers. And over in the detection column, I could have a very low detection rating, which means I know that I'm going to kill somebody because that spec's wrong, okay? So bottom line is you can have an RPN of 18 and a design team of you'd never want to ship. And so the fundamental problem with all three of these items is they all use detection. There is no detection component in risk. It's just severity of harm and probability of occurrence. And if I had more detail or more time, I'd go through each one of these and give you examples of why they don't work. Now, the scary part about this action priority, uh, for those of you in the automotive industry, there's a new proposed AIG VDA FEMA handbook that is out for public uh, discussion right now. You get the comment till the end of March, I'm sorry, end of February, and they're recommending this use of AP. This, this, this AP that they are recommending has some of the same weaknesses and will cause some of the same difficulties that RPN does. So you need to look at that and you need to study it. Okay, so now finally to the question, so I worked on my risk, I haven't gotten rid of all of it, when can I release? You know, how much risk is acceptable? And that's where what we call risk policy comes in. Now this severity table here, this is from the medical industry. I have a lot of medical clients and instead of using 10 severity ratings, they use five, where five is death and one is inconvenient or, inconvenience or temporary discomfort, okay? And then they have occurrence ratings, they don't get into the probability, they're more subjective. And then they have symbols, D is death, obviously a very bad one, and NI would be inconvenience. Now what you see here is two different products, and I've actually worked on both of these. One of them is late stage cancer treatments. Now I've worked on cancer treatments that were targeted at stage four cancer patients. So the bottom line is, if we don't do anything to help that patient, that patient's going to die, okay? So when we're developing this cure, oftentimes there's things we have to do that will put them at risk of death or permanent injury, you know, they chemotherapy can kill people, radiation can kill people. So what happens here, in the case of this particular situation, I won't release a product here because I'm not doing anything to increase the survival rate. However, I may very well release a product here because that's gonna, it's gonna help some people survive that wouldn't survive. On the flip side, if you come in for, you have a bad back, a sore back, you don't want me to kill you, you don't want me to permanently injure you, okay? So if I'm gonna do any of these during spinal implant surgery, that's gonna be a no-go. So when I'm designing this spinal implant, the only allowable risks that I will allow are the ones that fall in these two categories. If I felt in my design that it was up in here, I wouldn't release that design. I wish I could say, does anybody have any questions, but I can't see it. Okay. Actually, actually Rich, if I can just ju jump in real quick, just a reminder for people in case you, uh, for those of you who came here late, uh, if you've got questions for us, and we are getting some questions, so thank you everybody who's sending those. If you've got questions, use the Q&A box, uh, which you will see, most of you will see in the lower right hand corner of your screen. You can click and send us a question using that Q&A box, or if you see a green drop down menu, at the top of your screen, mouse over that green drop down, you'll see a Q&A button, click that. That'll open up the Q&A box and you can send us your questions and we are, I'm racking up the questions for you. Sounds great, okay. All right, go ahead, Rich. All right, okay, so, so the bottom line is, it's not enough to just say, what do I have to work on? Because like I said before, if you wait till you have a perfect design, a perfect process, you will never ship a product. So you not only have to have within your company what it is, what risk you're gonna say we're gonna work on, but you also have to have within your company a risk policy, and that risk policy can differ depending on the type of product that you're making. So the next question is, what types of risk management does a standard require 
the companies to use? The answer is none. Okay, the standard does not say you have to use design theme or process theme or usage. It doesn't tell you what to use. It's very non-prescriptive. So the bottom line is, is whatever risk management tool you believe helps you do the best job, that's the one you should use. Now, it's very important that whatever risk management tool you select, that you use it correctly. Now, the majority of my clients, actually 100% of my clients, they all use design schemas and process schemas. So we've got 30 years of experience of looking at these things. And what I'm going to go over now is some common mistakes that we see. The two most common design theme mistakes that we see is over in this requirements column, an unverifiable function or requirement. It just says something like, lawnmower has to cut grass, okay? The problem with that is I got a failure mode here that says, does not cut the grass cleanly. Well, what does that mean to cut the grass cleanly, okay? What we need here, over here in this requirement, is a definition of cut, an engineering term, so that when we design the product, we can determine whether or not we're meeting the requirement. So the number one issue that I see is this first one, and that is people do not, you have to write your requirements to a level of detail that your design engineers can design to them without question. The second mistake I see is over here in the cause column. People tend to put what we like, I guess, mechanisms of failure, okay? So they're basically saying, I want to cut the grass. I didn't cut the grass cleanly. Why? Because my mower blade was worn. Well, that's not a root, the only, what's the designer supposed to do with that, okay? The bottom line is this design fails for one and only one reason, and that's because the product design specification is incorrectly set. This design FEMA's job is to audit every specification you're going to give manufacturing to build to. So in this cause column, the only allowable entry you should ever put here is a possible mistake that may have been made when setting a, when setting a specification. Otherwise, you have not put what we like to call a root cause or the root source of this particular failure mode. Now, this mistake of unverifiable functions or requirements and causes that don't have specs in them, these two mistakes are commonly found in design schemas that are generated using what we call structure, function, and failure analysis. This is a methodology that was developed in Europe that uh, the, in the proposed handbook, they're basically suggesting it should be adopted in the U.S. What happens is because of this methodology, and we're actually going to be in the next week or so, I'm going to be publishing an article in Quality Digest detailing why this methodology consistently leads to these two problems. And the bottom line is, my personal opinion that if this proposed methodology goes through, the effectiveness of the design team is created in the U.S. automotive industry is going to go down, and the time that it takes to create them is going to go up. And so I'd uh, you know, look forward to the next few days or whatever, and you'll be seeing this article pop. And I, if you read the article and you agree with it, I would ask you contact the AIAG. They're asking for open comments until the end of February and let them know. And if you don't agree, you're going to find an interesting challenge in the article that I welcome you all to take on. Uh, three most common process FEMA mistakes are, again, let's go over what a process FEMA is supposed to do. This is a point-in-time assessment of the adequacy of this process in producing an inspect product. So basically when we're painting the motor housing, we want to make sure that that painting that we do meets the spec, and obviously the presence of a peeling defect would not meet the spec. Okay, and so um, kind of I missed this one here. We'll get back. I'm going to go continue with this. So 
So a failure cause that I see a lot of is a description of an incoming product condition. So in this particular case, we're saying when we went to paint the motor housing, the paint peeled because the stamping that I got from the previous operation, it had contamination on it. Well, bottom line is what that means is this paint defect didn't start at the painting mower station. This started at the station where this product condition started. So what should happen is at that particular station, let's say it was the stamping area, where this contamination got created, it should be assigned the defect, the paint defects, even though that paint defect doesn't exist there, okay? This bullet point down here, I should have went with my notes. Uh, this first one is a major, 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 major issue. Uh, bottom line is, is uh, you'll hear a lot of FEMA classes and even the new AIG VDA manual says that uh, you're, you're to assume that the incoming product is received within spec. Well, I spent 14 years in a manufacturing plant, last job as a plant manager, and I can guarantee you that our suppliers didn't always send us in spec materials. In fact, for many companies, this receiving action door is one of the greatest sources of risk that you have. I'm not telling you to inspect all your incoming product, but I'm just telling you, you need to include this in your process, FEMA, and you have to have a strategy for controlling that incoming risk coming from your suppliers. The last one that we talk about is failure, um, uh, non-root cause and a failure cause column. In this particular case, we have to heat treat the motor blade. The motor blade hardness is too low, but instead of being specific, we just say the heat treat oven is too cold. At this level of detail, I cannot even define how to begin to prevent this. All I can do is contain the defect. There are three causes that you never want to put in this column. One is what we call operator error. Another one is incorrect setup. And the third one is some type of equipment condition, which is what this is. I see those in probably 95% of the FEMAs that I first review when we, before we start helping companies. Okay, the other thing the standard, a big part of the standard is plan, do, check, act. And the standard wants you to use risk-based thinking when you do plan, do, check, act. So what does plan, do, check, act look like with risk-based thinking? Well, the normal one is you plan what you're going to do, you do it, you check to see if you did it, and then if not, you change the results. The only with, Now, with risk-based thinking, basically, you develop a plan, but before you do the plan, you assess the risk of it. And only if the risk opportunity ratio is acceptable, do you do it. So if the risk is okay, you do it, you measure the results, and if it doesn't work, you gotta develop another plan. And again, like we did before, before we do the new plan, we have to assess the risk of doing it. Okay, next question I get asked a lot about is what do we have to document? Well, the bottom line is the standard does not require you to have a formalized risk management system, doesn't require you to have a procedure. No auditor is going to walk through your door and say, show me your procedure. You know, the old, the old ISA was, you know, document what you do and do what you document. Well, that's not going to happen. They're going to come to you and say, show me evidence that you're using risk-based thinking. Well, that means you're going to have to have evidence of a risk. You're going to have to have evidence of how you assessed it, how you measured severity of harm and probability of occurring, or how you arrived at the probability of it. You're going, to have to, you're going to have to have documented what you did and then how you went back to see whether or not it worked, okay? And you're going to have to develop, define all of those processes that I talked about and what the interactions are. So the bottom line is, is you're not going to have to have a procedure you're not going to, you know, I, I, I struggle with not having a formalized program because I don't know how you implement something that's not formalized, but, but that's not a requirement, but you are going to have to have evidence of doing it. Okay, now those are the top 10 things. Now, what happens with risk-based thinking, and, you know, you think about uh, the flow we had when we went from customer requirements all the way down to the controls on the floor. 
that's a lot of detail. That's a lot of time. And in order to do those, in order to do those risk, uh, apply those risk tools, develop those risk tools, it takes resources. Your smartest people takes time, and there's a lot of complexity. And when I was faced with this challenge as a plant manager and saying, you know, I had a plant, I had 700 people, I had 300 pieces of equipment, 17 operations, I'm like, how do I apply this stuff? And what I realized was is that what I had in my plant, we had best practices. Unfortunately, they were in the heads of the people, okay? So I was dependent on the quality of the people that I had on the, on the staff that particular day. So I said to myself, if I could take and document what our best practice, bring our best people in and put our, use that as our best practices, we should be able to develop a best practice. In our case, I was in manufacturing, a best case of manufacturing. And we should have companies who design products should have best practices of design. And I said, the risk management tool, the design theme is nothing more than a point in time assessment of how good your best design practices are. And, and the process theme is nothing more than a point in time assessment of how good your manufacturing practices are. And my master's is in computer design. And I said, if I can capture those, I can auto generate and reuse that knowledge of all of our people. So instead of bringing all these people into all these FEMA sessions, and starting from scratch each time, we can have our best practice. So when we bring these people in, we can start way further ahead. And this is what we call com uh, computerized. Basically, you use a computer to aid you. And I'm going to quickly show you what that looks like. Here's the front screen of our software we call Risk-Based PLM. And what I'm going to show you, this particular database, this particular company, what they do is they make um, they make equipment to manufacture cars, okay? And they happen to working on a particular Ford line here, and actually we did this one yesterday. So they are, they're building a station where there'll be a manual load, uh, one single person load, and they'll have a robot spot welder and a pedestal respot weld. Now what we've done at this company is we brought the best people in, and we've now modeled their best practices of both designing equipment, building equipment, maintaining equipment, and using equipment. So what they do is they come in like we did yesterday, and our current model has, I think it's uh, 1,463 optional features. So they come in here, and amongst all these features, they describe the ones that are part of this particular station. And once they have those features, they save it, they hit OK, and they, sorry, I hit the wrong button there, and they say make it. And what, what it's doing right now is if you remember our entire risk map of all those different tools, it's now writing starting documents for every one of those. So as an example, I'm just going to show you one of them. Okay, so if I come here, and I go design FEMA, and basically they're, they're creating equipment, so they're going to want the machinery version. So here's the product we just created. So based on the features that they picked, there's 400 risk issues they have to consider and deal with in this equipment design before they release it to their build people. So the really, really powerful thing about this is now they can go use the document and this is the best practices, this is the best knowledge of the smartest people they have, and they're basically leveraging their expertise. So let's get out of here. Okay, so the bottom line is, is once they select those features, everything you see here in green, the starting documents, every one of them, which is customized to this particular product, is automatically generated. Now, when we work with Abbott Labs, they don't build equipment. What they do is they analyze, dis analyze diseases. So like when we're working on HIV and we're working with intervening, you know, we know that the person catching HIV might be a drug user. Inside our FEMA, there's pretty, it was pretty wild doing these FEMAs, we would talk about what's the impact of heroin in the bloodstream on our ability to see the HIV virus. So needless to say, the models that get created look totally different, but the really cool thing is you can take these risk tools 
and you can take computer-aided risk management and apply it to anything. And then the number one reason for implementing risk-based thinking is because of what it can do for you. What I tell when I'm teaching somebody, I say, can you imagine what your life would be if the products you're working on, you always got the customer requirements right, you got the design requirements right, the specs were right, you built it to spec, and you, you gave your customers instructions that they used it as intended, what improvement would that be in your life? And they're like, wow, that'd be really cool, you know? This is why you should do risk-based thinking. Now, a caveat is there is so much confusion about this standard that I feel pretty confident in saying that there's going to be many times when an auditor comes in and tells you, yeah, you're doing risk-based thinking correctly, but if you don't see drops, if you don't do a better job of doing these five things that you see here, you're not doing it right. And as I used to tell my, I used to tell my people before an audit, I go, if we can't fool an auditor for a day, we don't deserve our jobs. However, the ultimate audit is that we make money. So your ultimate measuring stick when you look at risk-based thinking should not be just compliance because, to be honest with you, I don't think it's going to be that difficult. It should be, are you getting better in these five areas? That's it. I'll take questions if you have any. Oh, what's that, Rich? I, that's it. If you got any questions, oh, I'll it. be more oh, than awesome. happy. Yeah. Perfect. Oh, we do have questions. And also, uh, you'll see uh, Rich's uh, contact uh, information there. So we're going to keep that slide up as we go through the questions. We've got a lot of great questions, Rich, and I'm going to go through these in okay. no particular order. Um, one, uh, I'm going to lump these two questions together. Uh, this was at the very beginning. Uh, you know, I guess this analysis requires discussions with attorneys and insurance providers. That's a question. So the goal is to keep liability to a minimum to minimize litigation. Uh, I guess is that one of the goals of what we're doing here? No. No. Okay. No? <laughs> and that's an interesting question because when I – I can't mention the company because I'm under confidentiality. When we first started doing design themas and we went to the cause column of the design theme, I said, the only thing you're allowed to write there is how you might have screwed the spec up. And the lead manager, and this is a very large automotive company, said, I'm not going to say in a design theme that I might have set the spec wrong. Our, our lawyers will never allow us to do that. Okay, so we basically, not the lens important, we had about a 200-page document on all the mistakes his designers could make. and. So we brought the attorneys in, and they absolutely loved the document because they basically said what this shows is due diligence. This shows that we paid attention to everything and did everything right. The last people you need in your FEMA sessions are attorneys. <laughs> Um, somebody asked, uh, there was a couple questions about HACCP. Uh, so does this work similar to a HACCP, finding critical points in each in fact, procedure? We, we actually do, uh, we actually use this information to auto-generate uh, risk hazard analysis. Okay, so you can use this information uh, to basically supplement that activity. So it follows a very similar procedure, and like I said, a lot of the, like, for the, the particular, uh, uh, like, as far as, like, risk hazard analysis go, okay, one of the requirements of every, um, when you make a line for an automotive company, which I'm doing with my client, okay, we literally have built a model of every hazard that comes into play when you have a particular component or you're trying to do a particular task. So on that screen where you pick the different components, we not only auto-generate those risk documents, we auto-generate the beginning hazard analysis for the people. Um, somebody missed one. Um, when you were talking about the three never use as failure cause, this person, uh, she okay. captured the, uh, she got the equipment and the operator. What was the third one? Or maybe just, just say what all those three were again. Okay. Incorrect setup, operator error, and some form of equipment malfunction such as the oven was too hot or something like that. Okay. So, so basically, the, and that last the, 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 go ahead. Those are the three. That most last popular. one is 
Okay, so the last one is, is, is an equipment state. It's not actually what the reason for that. So, so you're saying you where it. the equipment is, not why it got there. Yeah, yeah don't tell me what <laughs> it didn't do. Tell me why it didn't do it. Why, it's why only it didn't when you do tell it. me okay. why it didn't do it that I can make it go away. Another, okay. you know, we didn't talk about control plans, but an audit you all can do on your control plans. Those of you familiar with the automotive, there's a process column. And there's a product column. Product columns are, is when you look at the product. Process columns when you look at your process, control your process. Add up the number of entries in your process column. Add up the number of entries in your product column. The number of entries in your process should outnumber product by a factor of 10 to 1 or greater. And what you're going to find, it's actually reversed. You're going to find that most of your controls are looking at the product. Most people don't do control plans, they do inspection plans. And the reason they do inspection plans is when they do their FEMAs, they don't get to a root cause, so they don't know how to control the process. Okay. When we did this in our plant after nine months, on average six grand a week investment, we were saving on average $144,000 every single week in reduced rework and reject. Wow. And um, I became a believer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a question we get quite a bit. Um, usually when we talk about all this, we talk about manufacturing. So this question is, can all this be related to a service organization as well, such as a shipping service? We actually, yeah, we do a class on, we have a class on that as well. Yeah, it's basically you have a product, okay? Not only can you apply the process side to it is when you decide, just like, you know, I talked about making sure you have the right, design requirements to design to, well, when you set up the objectives of your service, how do you know those objectives are set up correctly, okay? So basically, we have a class that for companies who are in the service industries on how to apply these techniques the same way. You just need a slightly little different twist, but you have the same thing. Anytime you don't deliver the intended service target, there's your objectionable incident, the effects of it, there's your harm, and the root cause is what we're – like cutting grass if we use our mower. if you Instead of selling mowers, if you cut grass, your requirement is going to be height of the grass. Anytime you make that height of the grass too short, the harm is going to be your damage in the guy's grass. And you go over to the cause call and you say, why was it too short? Well, the guy cutting it set the mower too low. We just did uh, risk-based thinking on mowing a lawn. Um, yeah, here's, you were speaking of automotive earlier. Uh, I heard this person saying, I heard GM came out with a new method to prioritize risk called risk limited method. It has three matrices and yeah. does include detection in one of them. What are your thoughts on that? Doesn't work. Okay. That's, okay. that's this. And again, that is this priority level, which uses the detection zone. We actually have clients who use our software, and they came to me, you know, and said, Rich, I need this column. To us, it's just another form of RPN. And if I had 10 minutes, I could show everybody why this doesn't work. But if GM tells you to do it, and you're a supplier to GM, okay, you you're going to put it. this column in the FEMA. But right. yes, you can do it. No, you, I mean, your cust you got to do it for your customer, but the risk matrix is much more powerful. Okay. Um, we had a couple questions uh, related to management representative, and I'll just lump those together. Uh, right. First one, uh, the, the, somebody just to comment on the absence of the management representative replaced by leadership, and this one's a little bit more specific. How do we redefine the management representative office attached to quality department for ISO 9001 2015? I'm going to have to pass on that one. That's, uh, I, I, I haven't, I, I can't really answer that. I wish I could, okay. but I won't lie to you. Okay. Um, the risk table criteria looks great, but it is focused on product, product risk only. What about a suggested criteria for occurrence and severity classifications when dealing with non product related cases? And I mean by that when dealing with quality system cases. Well it's the same I mean it's the same thing, okay? So all right, so let's say you have a you know, no matter what the process is, okay, 
that process has failures. Okay, all right? And there's a probability of those failures. So whether it's, um, you know, I, I wish, I mean, if I had any process, if they gave me a process, I could apply it quickly. But the bottom line is, you know, you know, filling out a time card, okay? Um, what's the probability of the guy doing it wrong, okay? And the harm of that is he's not going to be paid right. You know, th this risk column, okay, this severity of harm, it doesn't describe harm due to what. It could be harm due to a service, like, you know, it could be harm due to a product failing, okay? You don't need another T, but one of the biggest, I mean, I've been in this for 30 years, okay? One of the biggest mistakes I see people making is, they try to add complexity where complexity isn't needed. I mean, we got good, I mean, there's some fixes that have to be made because there's been stuff grandfathered. But the bottom line is, is like um, this risk table works fine and I'd bet my whole house on it. If, I, if somebody, I will do this. I'll give a thousand bucks to anybody's charity who can provide me with an example and you've got my email address that this risk table won't work on. Send me your example and I'll show you how it works because I'm fully confident you can't give me anything this won't work on. Right. thousand bucks to um, your charity. Um, you, you mentioned earlier, and uh, this person is asking for more detail on it, about incoming products, you know, uh, mm -hmm. your, 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 rec your receiving door. So as far yep. as incoming products from a supplier, should all of them be inspected as it can be a risk of a product not operating properly mm -hmm. or out of spec? And, uh, yeah, maybe discuss that a little bit more because you kind of, okay. you kind of said, well, I'm not saying <coughs> that you should do that, but no. if it's a concern, what should you do? Okay, so this, this is what you do. When you do your – this is where the design team becomes so important. Okay, you always hear people say, "Oh, what are the critical characteristics?" Okay, well, your design FEMA, if done correctly, okay, will have the relationship between the incoming specs that you're purchasing and the performance of the product. And just like if you were doing like a design of experiment, some of those specs are more important and weightier than others. Okay. So what I tell people to do is go first, you know, you're, you, need, you need input from your design engineers. You go to the designer first and you understand what are the important specs, okay? Those important specs at a minimum, you need to know what your supplier's performance is. And the other thing is, is it's not just doing PPAP. You know, PPAP, you know, I'm an ex-plant manager, PPAP to me, doesn't do squat for me long term. I need to know that they're consistently delivering that. So what I tell, what I tell, you know, what we told our supplier, we identified what our most critical were. We went to our suppliers. We said we wanted SPC. If they, they weren't capable, we required 100% inspection. Now, where it gets tricky is if you're a small, I mean, we were a big company. We're Ford Motor Company, so I had a lot of clout. But if you're a small company, don't have clout, and your supplier says, hey, I ain't giving that to you, then you got a choice. You know, you got to try to stop it where you can. So, the things that you want to concentrate on, the characteristics you want to concentrate, you're looking for two things. One is impact on your product, and then after impact on the product, historically, which ones is this? Which ones has this supplier done not done well on? And you want to try to contain it. Um, somebody wants to know whether this can also be, we, we've been talking about specifically ISO 9001 uh, 2015. Mm -hmm. They want to know, will this also work for ISO 13485? Yeah, so I'm, I'm working on a Parkinson's treatment in three weeks for the company from Canada. We're using this for 13485 compliance. Okay. Uh, let's see here. We're, we're running over, but let, let's see. We'll just squeeze in a couple more questions here. By the way, if we don't get to your questions, I am sending all of these on to Rich, and, and he can get back to you after the fact. So, um, okay. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, uh, okay. You may have already touched on that, but let's let's hit it. Um, ISO 9001 2015 talks about internal and external issues and risks. Can you expand on that a bit? Mm -hmm. 
Well, I mean, um, again, it's all interpretation, okay? But like, okay, so an internal risk, I mean, you have internal suppliers, okay? You have feeder processes, so it's very important that just like you have, like when you do your risk assessment and you say you're, you're the final assembly process and you have feeder processes, it's very important that you identify the impact the feeder processes have on you. That's why if you remember way back when where I said, you know, what are the four critical steps, inputs and outputs, okay, this is where that internal thing comes in because the bottom line is, is you have risk flowing through your company and you need to stop that risk. I mean, it gets bigger as the further you let it go through. And then as far as external risk goes, I mean, you have anybody who gives you – I mean, you've got the external risk of your customers, you know, getting the right information from them. That's where the customer requirements come in, and we've already spent considerable time on the external risk presented to you by your suppliers. Okay. Um, and let's make this the last question here, or actually more of a, more of a statement. Uh, this is a statement. I'm going to try to phrase it as a question. Okay. Um, I was expecting more information about how to assess risk as it is associated with the overall QMS, not a discussion of FMEA. Uh, are those two, two different things, or are they the no. same thing? No. Well, no. The, as I said before, when I told you that the, I said the standard was non-prescriptive, okay? It didn't tell you what type of risk management tool to use, okay? So as an example, when, when I have here a uh, design product and we're going to put the product design through a design FEMA, that happens to be my chosen risk management tool. And I said when I started this that I'm going to show you a system that I believe is ISO compliant, but it's not the only way. So if the person who wrote that article has a different method than design FEMA or has a different method than requirement risk assessment, they would just, just plug, plug it in, in here. You know, yeah. so okay. the only reason I'm talking about design FEMA is that's I want to, you know, I read all this stuff about risk management, and they talk about bacon cakes and all this stuff you ain't never going to do. And I wanted to bring it to something that I knew a lot of people used, you know, to provide them with an example. But bottom line is, as I stated before, you got a better way than design FEMA, plug it in. Go for it. Because it's all not right. required that you use design FEMA. Okay. Um, well, excellent presentation, Rich. I really appreciate that. That was really, uh, really chock full of information. Getting some good feedback on this. Really good stuff. Um, and, and thanks to all of you also for joining us. Uh, the question did come up several times about a copy of the slides and uh, you know re the recording and so forth. Um, shortly, uh, within a day or so, you will be getting an email from Heart Coast Systems uh, with directions, uh, with instructions on how to. Uh, uh, get a copy of uh, a, a PDF of the slides and, and a copy of the recording. This, uh, that, that's right, Rich, right? Yeah, and I, I'd like to add one other thing. Yeah, we're going to make this free offer to anybody. Anybody who wants a quick review, want to send me a few pages of a FEMA, you'd like to say, hey, how good are these? How would you improve them? Uh, you've got our con my contact information here. Uh, send me a couple pages. I'd be more than happy to let you know what's good, what's bad, and how you can improve them. Free of charge, no cost. Oh, perfect. Okay. Great offer. Okay. So, uh, once again, thanks to all of you for joining us and from all of us at Quali Digest and Harpco Systems. Have a great day, and we will see you at the next webinar. So long.